The Prince and the Pauper by Mark Twain. Chapter Sixteen. The State Dinner. The dinner hour drew near. Yet strangely enough, the thought brought but slight discomfort to Tom and hardly any terror. The morning's experiences had wonderfully built up his confidence. The poor little ash cat was already more wanted to his strange garret after four days' habit than a mature person could have become in a full month. A child's facility in accommodating itself to circumstances was never more strikingly illustrated. Let us privileged ones hurry to the great banqueting room and have a glance at matters there whilst Tom is being made ready for the imposing occasion. It is a spacious apartment with gilded pillars and pilasters and pictured walls and ceilings. At the door stand tall guards as rigid as statues, dressed in rich and picturesque costumes and bearing halberds. In a high gallery which runs all around the place is a band of musicians and a packed company of citizens of both sexes in brilliant attire. In the center of the room, upon a raised platform, is Tom's table. Now let the ancient chronicler speak. A gentleman enters the room bearing a rod, and along with him another bearing a tablecloth, which, after they have both kneeled three times with the utmost veneration, he spreads upon the table, and, after kneeling again, they both retire. They come two others, one with a rod again, the other with a salt cellar, a plate, and bread. When they have kneeled, as the others had done, and placed what was brought upon the table, they too retire with the same ceremonies performed by the first. At last come two nobles, richly clothed, one bearing a tasting knife, who, after prostrating themselves three times in the most graceful manner, approach and rub the table with bread and salt, with as much awe as if the king had been present. Footnote. Lee Hunts the Town, page 408, quotation from an early tourist. End of footnote. So end the solemn preliminaries. Now, far down the echoing corridors, we hear a bugle-blast, and the indistinct cry, "'Place for the King! Way for the King's Most Excellent Majesty!' These sounds are momently repeated, they grow nearer and nearer, and pleasantly, almost in our faces, the martial note peals, and the cry rings out, "'Way for the King!' At this instant the shining pageant appears, and files in at the door, with a measured march. Let the chronicler speak again. First come gentlemen, barons, earls, knights of the garter, all richly dressed and bareheaded. Next comes the chancellor, between two, one of which carries the royal sceptre, the other the sword of state in a red scabbard, studded with golden fleur-de-lis, the point upwards. Next comes the king himself, whom, upon his appearing, twelve trumpets and many drums salute with a great burst of welcome, whilst all in the galleries rise in their places, crying, God save the king! After him come nobles attached to his person, and on his right and left march his guard of honor, his fifty gentlemen pensioners, with gilt battle-axes. This was all fine and pleasant. Tom's pulse beat high, and a glad light was in his eye. He bore himself right gracefully, and all the more so because he was not thinking of how he was doing it, his mind being charmed and occupied with the blithe sights and sounds about him. And besides, nobody can be very ungraceful in nicely fitting beautiful clothes after he has grown a little used to them, especially if he is for the moment unconscious of them. Tom remembered his instructions, and acknowledged his greeting with a slight inclination of his plumed head and a courteous, "'I thank ye, my good people.' He seated himself at table, without removing his cap, and did it without the least embarrassment, for to eat with one's cap on was the one solitary royal custom upon which the kings and the cantes met as upon common ground, neither party having any advantage over the other in the matter of old familiarity with it. The pageant broke up, and grouped itself picturesquely, and remained bare-headed. Now, to the sound of gay music, the yeomen of the guard entered. The tallest and mightiest men in England, they being carefully selected in this regard. But we will let the chronicler tell about it. The yeomen of the guard entered, bare-headed, clothed in scarlet, with golden roses upon their backs, and these went and came, bringing in each turn a course of dishes, served in plate. 
these dishes were received by a gentleman in the same order they were brought and placed upon the table while the taster gave to each guard a mouthful to eat of the particular dish he had brought for fear of any poison tom made a good dinner notwithstanding he was conscious that hundreds of eyes followed each morsel to his mouth and watched him eat it with an interest which could not have been more intense if it had been a deadly explosive and was expected to blow him up and scatter him all about the place he was careful not to hurry and equally careful not to do anything whatever for himself but wait till the proper official knelt down and did it for him he got through without a mistake a flawless and precious triumph when the meal was over at last and he marched away in the midst of his bright pageant with the happy noises in his ears of blaring bugles rolling drums and thundering acclamations he felt that if he had seen the worst of dining in public it was an ordeal which he would be glad to endure several times a day if by that means he could but buy himself free from some of the more formidable requirements of his royal office end of chapter 16 chapter 17 foo foo the first miles hendon hurried along toward the southwark end of the bridge keeping a sharp lookout for the persons he sought and hoping and expecting to overtake them presently he was disappointed in this however by asking questions he was enabled to track them part of the way through southwark then all traces ceased and he was perplexed as to how to proceed still he continued his efforts as best he could during the rest of the day nightfall found him leg-weary half famished and his desire as far from accomplishment as ever so he supped at the tabard inn and went to bed resolved to make an early start in the morning and give the town an exhaustive search as he lay thinking and planning he presently began to reason thus the boy would escape from the ruffian his reputed father if possible would he go back to london and seek his former haunts no he would not do that he would avoid recapture what then would he do never having had a friend in the world or a protector until he met miles hendon he would naturally try to find that friend again provided the effort did not require him to go toward london and danger he would strike for hendon hall that is what he would do for he knew hendon was homeward bound and there he might expect to find him yes the case was plain to hendon he must lose no more time in southwark but move at once through ghent toward monk's home searching the wood and inquiring as he went let us return to the vanished little king now the ruffian whom the waiter at the inn on the bridge saw about to join the youth and the king did not exactly join them but fell in close behind them and followed their steps he said nothing his left arm was in a sling and he wore a large green patch over his left eye he limped slightly and used an oaken staff as a support the youth led the king a crooked course through Southwark, and by and by struck into High Road beyond. The king was irritated now, and said he would stop here. It was Hendon's place to come to him, not his to go to Hendon. He would not endure such insolence. He would stop where he was. The youth said, "'Thou tarry here, and thy friend lying wounded in the wood yonder? So be it, then.' The king's manner changed at once, and he cried out, "'Wounded? And who hath dared to do it?' but that is apart lead on lead on faster sirrah art shod with lead wounded is he now though the doer of it be a duke's son he shall rue it it was some distance to the wood but the space was speedily traversed the youth looked about him discovered a bow sticking in the ground with a small bit of rag tied to it then led the way into the forest watching for similar bows and finding them at intervals they were evidently guides to the point he was aiming at by and by an open place was reached where were the charred remains of a farmhouse and near them a barn which was falling to ruin and decay there was no sign of life anywhere and utter silence prevailed the youth entered the barn the king following eagerly upon his heels no one there the king shot a surprised and suspicious glance at the youth and asked where is he a mocking laugh was his answer the king was in a rage in a moment he seized a billet of wood and was in the act of charging upon the youth when another mocking laugh fell upon his ear it was from the lame ruffian who had been following at a distance the king turned and said angrily who art thou what is thy business here leave thy foolery said the man and quiet thyself my disguise is none so good that thou canst pretend thou knowest not thy father through it thou art not my father i know thee not i am the king if thou hast hid my servant find him for me or thou shalt sup sorrow for what thou hast done john canty replied in a stern 
and measured voice. "'It is plain thou art mad, and I am loath to punish thee. But if thou provoke me, I must. Thy prating doth no harm here where there are no ears that need to mind thy follies. Yet is it well to practice thy tongue to wary speech, that it may do no hurt when our quarters change. I have done a murder, and may not tarry at home, neither shalt thou, seeing I need thy service. My name is changed, for wise reasons. It is Hobbs, John Hobbs. Thine is Jack. Charge thy memory accordingly. Now then, speak. Where is thy mother? Where are thy sisters? They came not to the place appointed. Knowst thou whither they went? The king answered sullenly, Trouble me not with these riddles. My mother is dead. My sisters are in the palace. The youth nearby burst into a derisive laugh, and the king would have assaulted him. But Canty, or Hobbes, as he now called himself, prevented him, and said, Peace, Hugo, vex him not. His mind is astray, and thy ways fret him. Sit thee down, Jack, and quiet thyself. Thou shalt have a morsel to eat anon. Hobbes and Hugo fell to talking together in low voices, and the king removed himself as far as he could from their disagreeable company. He withdrew into the twilight of the farther end of the barn. When he found the earthen floor bedded a foot deep with straw, he lay down here, drew straw over himself in lieu of blankets, and was soon absorbed in thinkings. He had many griefs, but the minor ones were swept almost into forgetfulness by the supreme one, the loss of his father. To the rest of the world the name of Henry the Eighth brought a shiver, and suggested an ogre whose nostrils breathed destruction, and whose hand dealt scourgings and death. But to this boy the name brought only sensations of pleasure. The figure it invoked wore a countenance that was all gentleness and affection. He called to mind a long succession of loving passages between his father and himself, and dwelt fondly upon them, his unstinted tears attesting how deep and real was the grief that possessed his heart. As the afternoon wasted away, the lad, wearied with his troubles, sank gradually into a tranquil and healing slumber. After a considerable time, he could not tell how long, his senses struggled to a half-consciousness, and as he lay with closed eyes, vaguely wondering where he was and what had been happening, he noted a murmurous sound, the sullen beating of rain upon the roof. A snug sense of comfort stole over him, which was rudely broken, the next moment, by a chorus of piping cackles and coarse laughter. It startled him disagreeably, and he unmuffled his head to see whence this interruption proceeded. A grim and unsightly picture met his eye. A bright fire was burning in the middle of the floor at the other end of the barn, and around it, and lit weirdly up by the red glare, lolled and sprawled the motliest company of tattered gutter-scum and ruffians of both sexes he had ever read or dreamed of. There were huge, stalwart men, brown with exposure, long-haired, and clothed in fantastic rags. There were middle-sized youths, of truculent countenance, and similarly clad. There were blind mendicants with patched or bandaged eyes, crippled ones with wooden legs and crutches, there was a villain-looking peddler with his pack, a knife-grinder, a tinker, and a barber-surgeon with the implements of their trades. Some of the females were hardly grown girls, some were at prime, some were old and wrinkled hags, and all were loud, brazen, foul-mouthed, and all soiled and slatternly. There were three sore-faced babies, there were a couple of starveling curs with strings about their necks, whose office was to lead the blind. The night was come, the gang had just finished feasting, an orgy was beginning, the can of liquor was passing from mouth to mouth. A general cry broke forth, A song! A song from the bat, and Dick Dotton go one! One of the blind men got up, and made ready by casting aside the patches that sheltered his excellent eyes, and the pathetic placard which recited the cause of his calamity. Dot and Go One disencumbered himself of his timber leg, and took his place upon sound and healthy limbs, beside his fellow rascal. Then they roared out a rollicking ditty, and were reinforced by the whole crew at the end of each stanza in a rousing chorus. By the time the last stanza was reached, the half-drunken enthusiasm had risen to such a pitch that everybody joined in and sang it clear through from the beginning, producing a volume of villainous sound that made the rafters quake. These were the inspiring words. Bein darkmans then, bows, mort, and ken, the bein coves beings awast, on chaties to trine by Rome coves dine, for his long lib at last. 
binged out bein morts and tour and tour bing out of the rome vile bine and tour the cove that cloyed your duds upon the chaties to trine footnote from the english rogue london sixteen sixty five end of footnote Conversation followed, not in the thieves' dialect of the song, for that was only used in talk when unfriendly ears might be listening. In the course of it it appeared that John Hobbs was not altogether a new recruit, but had trained in the gang at some former time. His later history was called for, and when he said he had accidentally killed a man, considerable satisfaction was expressed. When he added that the man was a priest, he was roundly applauded, and had to take a drink with everybody. Old acquaintances welcomed him joyously, and new ones were proud to shake him by the hand. He was asked why he had tarried away so many months. He answered, "'London is better than the country, and safer these late years. The laws be so bitter and so diligently enforced, and I had not had that accident, I had stayed there. I had resolved to stay, and never more venture countrywards. But the accident has ended that.' He inquired how many persons the gang numbered now. The ruffler, or chief, answered, Five and twenty sturdy budges, bulks, files, clapper dozens, and maunders, counting the dells and doxies and other morts. Footnote. Canting terms for various kinds of thieves, beggars, and vagabonds, and their female companions. End of footnote. Most are here, the rest are wandering eastward along the winter lay. We follow at dawn. I do not see the when among the honest folk about me. Where may he be? Poor lad, his diet is brimstone now, and over-hot for a delicate taste. He was killed in a brawl somewhere about midsummer. I sorrow to hear that. The when was a capable man, and brave. That was he truly. Black Bess, his dell, is of us yet, but absent on the eastward tramp. A fine lass, of nice ways and orderly conduct. None ever seeing her drunk above four days in the seven. She was ever strict, I remember it well, a goodly wench, and worthy all commendation. Her mother was more free and less particular, a troublesome and ugly-tempered beddle dame, but furnished with a wit above the common. We lost her through it. Her gift of palmistry and other sorts of fortune-telling begot for her at last a witch's name and fame. The law roasted her to death at a slow fire. It did touch me to a sort of tenderness to see the gallant way she met her lot, cursing and rivaling all the crowd that gaped and gazed around her, whilst the flames licked upward toward her face and catched her thin locks and crackled about her old gray head. Cursing them, said I, cursing them. Why, and thou wouldst live a thousand years, thou'dst never hear so masterful a cursing. Alack, her art died with her. There be base and weakling imitations left, but no true blasphemy." The ruffler sighed. The listeners sighed in sympathy. A general depression fell upon the company for a moment, for even hardened outcasts like these are not wholly dead to sentiment, but are able to feel a fleeting sense of loss and affliction at wide intervals and under peculiarly favouring circumstances, as in cases like to this, for instance, when genius and culture depart and leave no heir. However, a deep drink all round soon restored the spirits of the mourners. "'Have any others of our friends fared hardly?' asked Hobbs. "'Some, yes, particularly newcomers, such as small husbandmen, turned shiftless and hungry upon the world because their farms were taken from them and to be changed to sheep-ranges. They begged and were whipped at the cart's tail, naked from the girdle up, till the blood ran, then set in the stocks to be pelted. They begged again, were whipped again, and deprived of an ear. They begged a third time, poor devils, what else could they do? And were branded on the cheek with a red-hot iron, then sold for slaves. They ran away, were hunted down, and hanged. Tis a brief tale, and quickly told. Others of us have fared less hardly. Stand forth, Yokel, Burns, and Hodge. Show your adornments." These stood up, and stripped away some of their rags, exposing their backs crisscrossed with ropey old welts left by the lash. One turned up his hair and showed the place where a left ear had once been. Another showed a brand upon his shoulder, the letter V, and a mutilated ear. The third said, I am Yokel, once a farmer and prosperous, with loving wife and kids. Now am I somewhat different in estate and calling, and the wife and kids are gone. 
Mayhap they are in heaven, mayhap in, in the other place. But the kindly God be thanked, they bide no more in England. My good old blameless mother strove to earn bread by nursing the sick. One of these died, the doctors knew not how, so my mother was burnt for a witch, whilst my babes looked on and wailed English law. Up all with your cups, now all together and with a cheer. Drink to the merciful English law that delivered her from the English hell. Thank you, mates, one and all. I begged from house to house, I and the wife, bearing with us the hungry kids. But it was crime to be hungry in England, so they stripped us and lashed us through three towns. Drink ye all again to the merciful English law. For its lash drank deep of my Mary's blood, and its blessed deliverance came quick. She lies there in the potter's field, safe from all harms. And the kids, well, whilst the law lashed me from town to town, they starved. Drink, lads, only a drop, a drop to the poor kids, that never did any creature harm. I begged again, begged for a crust, and got the stocks and lost an ear. See, here bides the stump. I begged again, and here is the stump of the other to keep me minded of it. And still I begged again, and was sold for a slave. Here on my cheek under this stain, if I washed it off, ye might see the red S, the branding iron left there. A slave. Do ye understand that word? An English slave. That is he that stands before ye. I have run from my master, and when I am found, the heavy curse of heaven fall on the law and the land that hath commanded it, I shall hang. Footnote enslaving. So young a king and so ignorant a peasant were likely to make mistakes, and this is an instant in point. The peasant was suffering from this law by anticipation. The king was venting his indignation against a law which was not yet in existence, for this hideous statute was to have birth in this little king's own reign. However, we know from the humanity of his character that it could never have been suggested by him. End of footnote. A ringing voice came through the murky air. "'Thou shalt not! And this day the end of that law is come!' All turned and saw the fantastic figure of the little king approaching hurriedly. As it emerged into the light and was clearly revealed, a general explosion of inquiries broke out. "'Who is it? What is it? Who art thou, mannequin?' The boy stood unconfused in the midst of all those surprised and questioning eyes, and answered with princely dignity, "'I am Edward!' King of England!" A wild burst of laughter followed, partly of derision and partly of delight in the excellence of the joke. The King was stung. He said sharply, "'Ye mannerless vagrants! Is this your recognition of the royal boon I have promised?' He said more, with angry voice and excited gesture, but it was lost in a whirlwind of laughter and mocking exclamations. John Hobbs made several attempts to make himself heard above the din, and at last succeeded, saying, "'Mates!' He is my son, a dreamer, a fool, and stark mad. Mind him not, he thinketh he is the king. I am the king, said Edward, turning toward him. As thou shalt know to thy cost in good time, thou hast confessed a murder, thou shalt swing for it. Thou'lt betray me, thou, and I get my hands upon thee. Tut, tut, said the burly ruffler, interposing in time to save the king, and emphasizing this service by knocking Hobbes down with his fist. Hast respect for neither kings nor rufflers? And thou insult my presence so again, I'll hang thee up myself. Then he said to his majesty, Thou must make no threats against thy mates, lad, and thou must guard thy tongue from saying evil of them elsewhere. Be king, if it please thy mad humor, but be not harmful in it. Sink the title thou hast uttered, tis treason. We be bad men, in some few trifling ways, but none among us is so base as to be traitor to his king. We be loving and loyal hearts in that regard. Note if I speak truth. Now, all together, long live Edward, King of England! Long live Edward, King of England! The response came with such a thunder-gust from the motley crew that the crazy building vibrated to the sound. The little king's face lighted with pleasure for an instant, and he slightly inclined his head and said with grave simplicity, "'I thank you, my good people.' This unexpected result threw the company into convulsions of merriment. When something like quiet was presently come again, the ruffler said, firmly, but with an accent of good nature, 
drop it boy tis not wise nor well humour thy fancy if thou must but choose some other title a tinker shrieked out a suggestion fofo the first king of the moon calves the title took at once every throat responded and a roaring shout went up of long live fofo the first king of the moon calves followed by hootings catcalls and peals of laughter hail him forth and crown him robe him sceptre him throne him these and twenty other cries broke out at once and almost before the poor little victim could draw a breath he was crowned with a tin basin robed in a tattered blanket throned upon a barrel and sceptred with the tinker's soldering iron then all flung themselves upon their knees about him and sent up a chorus of ironical wailings and mocking supplications whilst they swabbed their eyes with their soiled and ragged sleeves and aprons be gracious to us o sweet king trample not upon thy beseeching worms o noble majesty pity thy slaves and comfort them with a royal kick cheer us and warm us with thy gracious rays o flaming sun of sovereignty sanctify the ground with the touch of thy foot that we may eat the dirt and be ennobled deign to spit upon us o sire that our children's children may tell of thy princely condescension and be proud and happy for ever but the humorous tinker made the hit of the evening and carried off the honors kneeling he pretended to kiss the king's foot and was indignantly spurned whereupon he went about begging for a rag to paste over the place upon his face which had been touched by the foot saying it must be preserved from contact with the vulgar air and that he should make his fortune by going on the highway and exposing it to view at the rate of a hundred shillings a sight he made himself so killingly funny that he was the envy and admiration of the whole mangy rabble. Tears of shame and indignation stood in the little monarch's eyes, and the thought in his heart was, Had I offered them a deep wrong, they could not be more cruel. Yet have I proffered naught but to do them kindness, and it is thus they use me for it. End of chapter 17